No, skepticism is awesome. There it's you like go. A, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. Hello, everyone. This is Skeptical Activism. The skeptics strike back. So I'm Desiree Shell. I will be moderating the panel. I'm the host of the Canadian radio show, Skeptically Speaking. Thanks. And by day, for those of you who don't know, I'm a union organizer. <clears throat> Yeah, um, and so I have, a, I have a special interest in skeptical <coughs> activism, and I am joined by several wonderful panelists. Uh, each are skeptical activists in their own right, so I'll have them introduce themselves. Starting with DJ. Uh, starting with me, I'm DJ <coughs> Grothy, president of the James Randi Educational Foundation, uh, one of the national skeptic nonprofits. Thank you. And if, if from the perspective of a national nonprofit, we're very interested in organizing skeptics to advocate for our limited mission, which is promoting critical thinking about pseudoscience and the paranormal. Activism is where it's at. So it's not enough just to get together and kind of fetch about what you don't believe in, but do something about it. I love this idea of the panel. I'm Maria Walters. Uh, I write for skeptic.org. Uh, I also run the Atlanta Skeptics. Um, and. Uh, do a bunch of stuff like we're running a Vax Clinic here in, uh, at Dragon Con this year, and we did one last year as well. That's great. <laughs> I'm sure I'll be talking about that more later. Debbie? My name is Debbie Goddard. I'm the Campus Outreach Coordinator at the Center for Inquiry, which is also affiliated with the Council for Secular Humanism and the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. I'm also the coordinator of African Americans for Humanism, and I should be blogging for Skeptic more often than the twice I have <laughs> yes, this year <laughs> already. And Kylie? Hello, I'm Kylie Sturgis of the Token Skeptic Podcast. I blog at uh, podblack.com. I am a philosophy teacher when I'm back home in Australia, and I won an award from the Secular Students Alliance for doing. Um, activism uh, as a university student. And Brian. Hey guys, I'm Brian Brushwood. I tour colleges nationwide. In addition to doing my Bizarre Magic show, I also host a lecture called Scam Sasquatch and the Supernatural, and another one called um, How to Scam Your Way into Anything, talking about the uh, psychology of deception. And I also host the online series Scam School, which is all about how to score free drinks at the bar. <laughs> Okay, so let's set the stage. Um, I'm looking for your personal definitions of skeptical activism. And why don't we again start at this end and move down? DJ? So I'm speaking in my role as president of a national nonprofit. And as we tease out distinctions in our conversation, it's important that we realize there's a difference between what a national organization advancing a limited kind of skepticism would do versus what you know, any number of us might do, even though we call ourselves a skeptic, we might have other issues we find important, and what a local group would do. So we're talking about really three different uh, categories here when we're talking about skepticism. From my vantage, and, and there's a lot of overlap, obviously, but they're not identical from, in my view. Uh, uh, they're continuous, but not identical. From my vantage, skeptical activism is different than mere political activism or social issues activism, but it's activism focused on a confluence of three things, science advocacy or science literacy, kind of being a booster for science, consumer protection, so dealing with issues where people are often bamboozled and, and you want sort of a watchdog group or a watchdog community saying, hey, there's a huckster trying to pull the wool over these unduly credulous people's eyes and make a buck. And then uh, the, the third thing is that these are, these are claims that aren't already dealt with very well by mainstream organizations or groups. So that's why we concentrate on extraordinary claims or fringe science claims. In other words, not just advocating for science literacy in general, but on things that go bump in the night. That's what we focus on because ain't nobody else really doing that. That's our niche role. And Maria? 
So I, I, I agree. I think, uh, I think skeptical activism is taking concepts um, that have been used uh, for generations around uh, how to affect change uh, and applying those to affect change around science and critical thinking. Um, and I think that is, uh, I think that skeptics are relatively new in some ways to that. Uh, and, and I think there are obviously many different types of it. You can focus on educational, the educational side of things. You can also focus on more pressure type tactics. Um, and I think we can take what, like, the, a lot of the lessons that have al already been learned uh, from activism through uh, so social and political activism and apply those uh, and tweak them a little bit uh, to make them fit a little better for uh, really skeptical issues. Mm. Great. Debbie? Well, DJ covered a lot of the points that I was thinking of making, and it's probably because we were on a panel that actually got tangled up in these sorts of issues back in at the Amazing Meeting in July, uh, where we did ask kind of the difference between national organizations, skeptical activism, uh, uh, as opposed to what an individual can do as opposed to what a local group might get involved with. Um, so I want to second what DJ said. I am kind of curious. I think a lot of what we call skeptical activism is actually part of uh, education and not activism. And I complained at the panel we were at in July that we actually don't see a lot of skeptical activism in the sense of groups doing things to make change. You're right. We see and them get together and drink, we see them get together and sometimes have lectures and educational things, but not necessarily trying to implement uh, change, whether <coughs> political change or social change or whatever. And so I'm actually really interested to get to those sorts of issues in this panel, see if there are agreements and disagreements about that, but we'll see. Okay. Um, again, difficult to disagree with all the definitions have been put before. Um, certainly the notion of testable claims uh, comes up in terms of uh, sceptical activism. Um, I know that for my own part it's mostly been uh, claims in regards to health matters that have been out there mm. and trying to encourage uh, consumer awareness in that because I know that there are official groups within my state, within my country that are trying to deal with certain health claims and in many ways we just try to do a part and try to follow along in the same kind of lines that we think are going to be helpful and so checks and balances and trying to be aware about what our effective activist tactics are, are very much a, a good part and a, an important part of uh, being a skeptical activist. And um, certainly I would like probably more to be more proactive than rather just reactive. I thought the 1023 campaign, of which I'm wearing a t-shirt for, was an example of an international campaign that was attempting to deal with this and hopefully it becomes more successful and more direct in, in making change. Brian. So uh, being last on the line, there's not a whole lot that I can add there to be new to this, but I'd like to kick the question back over to you guys about the difference between skeptical activism versus skeptical outreach and uh, whether which one is a subset of the other, because obviously activism in general, certainly when you have somebody who has a fraudulent claim, you go on the nightly news and you challenge them to a showdown, mm -hmm. that certainly is, is skeptical act activism. But what about uh, other events when you do live mm -hmm. speaking events mm -hmm. and you educate the population? Is that a subsection of yeah. activism, or is activism a subsection of that outreach in general? Who wants it? Uh, so uh, you might be surprised that I think I have an answer to that. Um, I don't think one is a subset of the other. I think they're just two different things, two different approaches. Often they can work in concert. So. Debbie's spot on when she looks around and kind of is self-critical a bit of the skeptics movement and says, well, how much activism is there really? Because any, to the extent that we even have campaigns, coordinated campaigns, they're, they're rarely what I would describe as activism campaigns from my years kind of being a gay and lesbian, a GLBT activist, you know, where you're trying to affect meaningful, lasting social or political change. Instead, they're more like raising awareness campaigns. Yes. And we could call that activism and feel good about it, but uh, they're less about changing policies and more about increasing mind share. And that's the connection to what Brian just mentioned, outreach. So um, looking at this from the vantage of a national organization, uh, we do want to do activism, and we do want to change uh, uh, minds and policies, and we want to hold uh, uh, companies, say, to account, but we also want to increase mind share, and that's the outreach. And frankly, sometimes there's a uh, tension between activism and outreach, because the activism may make 
uh, parties even more strident and kind of m more certainly in their own camps and outreach says let's discuss this let's get involved uh, let's explore possibilities as opposed to do this because of this campaign so th sometimes there's a tension between the two as opposed to one being a subset of the other well let's try and make this a bit <coughs> less amorphous for people what uh, what kinds of skeptical activism are going on around the world does anyone want to share some that they've that they've found successful or they've found exciting uh, well we, we talked about this in the kickoff panel but I think a fantastic example <coughs> of the type of uh, and again you know I leave it to you guys to decide if it's outreach or activism but I love what the skeptic brothers in Australia are doing with the placebo bands it is a direct um, tongue-in-cheek uh, and and as powerful as the flying spaghetti monster in conveying your message without needing to directly challenge someone to a face-off, although certainly it gives the tools to the public in order to make that challenge in a very meaningful way face-to-face -face in shopping malls across right. America. Now, does everyone here know what the placebo bands aren't? Does, who doesn't? <laughs> Put your hand up. <laughs> okay, everyone, maybe just a little brief introduction to what it uh, is? Yeah, uh, if you haven't heard, uh, apparently there's magical wristbands that famous sports people like to wear that give them more balance, allegedly. Uh, and so what these guys did is they created placebo bands that have you know, an equally effective hologram, which is to say not effective at all. And uh, uh, it gives you the opportunity to, um, you know, instead of spending, originally they were charging $50 for these uh, pieces of silicone. And uh, now it gives you the opportunity. For example, it was perfect for what we did on Scam School. We did an, an episode where we taught people the tricks of leverage that you could use that, uh, uh, what is it called, uh, applied kinesiology, that allow you to create the sensation of suddenly having more strength or more balance. And it was phenomenal. It's, it's one of the most popular episodes of the show we've ever done. And people, as far as I know, they had to do another, you know, they told me they'd run out, but I warned them that we were doing the episode. And then so they started printing up more of these because it's the kind of thing people had a blast uh, actually, uh, you know, for the type of people who are so inclined to go to the mall and mess with some poor person who's making <laughs> eight bucks an hour, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to, to mess with them and directly challenge the methods for, uh, for, you know, how they induce these sensations of balance. Now, Kylie, you mentioned the 1023 campaign. Yeah, yeah, 10 quint uh, the 1023 campaign was mostly about wearing, uh, raising awareness of homeopathy and within the UK it was about targeting particular government support for homeopathy and it has since become a worldwide campaign. I, I even managed to get a gentleman uh, by the name of Dr Paul Willis to do a protest in uh, Antarctica by overdosing on uh, homeopathy whilst he was on a, uh, yeah it's great, you should check out the video. Um, it's on YouTube. and. However, although it is a campaign that has attempted to continue a global reach, the fact is, is that there is still evidence of homeopathy being promoted by governments, being promoted by a variety of people, and certainly raising questions in Parliament in the UK mm. can quite easily end up being people saying, right, OK, this, this year, in 2012, let's start using it to target our government systems, our health systems, and so forth. So it's an example of certainly of um, education, in a way. It's certainly an example of outreach, but I, I certainly hope that it will continue to be more focused in future and mm. really make effective change. Mm. So, now, I'm sorry. So I just I wanted to jump in a little um, because you guys touched on some, some really interesting things, um, particularly around outreach versus activism. And I actually don't see, um, I actually do see outreach as a subset of activism. Um, and I think that one of the problems that we run into um, is is with any campaign that we run, the, the reality is is we're doing outreach in some way. Um, so if we are running a vaccine clinic or we are picketing a homeopath, we are saying something about our organization and people are going to either identify with that or they're not. So we have right. to understand the messaging very carefully um, around the idea of outreach being pure or outreach for raising awareness and I think this is actually that something that the 1023 campaign is really interesting um, around is one of the problems I think that a lot of campaigns uh, run into is the lack of defined goals mm. and the lack of um, kind of measurable and uh, you know success exactly. criteria yeah. so yeah. how do you measure um, raising awareness? How do you measure that you raised awareness in the right way? Um, and so I think that it's it's really important to start think framing um, the conversations that we're having around what are our objectives and what are our goals, mm -hmm. whether it's for outreach or for a true, you know, pressure activism campaign 
or for a educational campaign, um, how are we going to say we succeeded? Right, um, what are the measurables? Yeah. Right, and how do you measure it? And I think that's really true across the board, um, whether you're talking about you know something that's purely around outreach or something that is, uh, I would say, it's a harder maybe activism. Um, I think 1023 is a great example of this. The first year they did, they did this, um, it was very contained around a particular pharmacy that had homeopathic medicines on the shelf in the UK boots. and they were yeah. yeah around boots and how they uh, and you know and demonstrations and overdoses outside of boots and the reaction and you know they wanted to know you know did we or did we not get it pulled from the shelves the second year they want they expanded that and it became a global a global thing and many many the Atlanta skeptics participated in it uh, and it was great but it, but it was a little bit more fuzzy what our goals were. What were we actually trying to accomplish? Was it going to be a media blitz? Were we trying to get coverage around it? Were we trying, you know, what are the things that we were trying to really accomplish from a, a measurable perspective? And I think that's one of the things that, that is an easy thing to fall into is that, well, at least we, we, we told people about it and we raised awareness. Right. That's a good thing, but unless, you know, you're putting a lot of time and effort into these things and it's important to make sure that you have a good sense of whether you're, whether you're succeeding or whether it was worth your time. What's mm. 1023 stand for? Um, <laughs> the 1023 campaign is a, it's a, um, 1023 is the, is Avogadro's number and it's the, it's a easy way to talk about the dilution level of a homeopathic solution. Um, so that was their, that was kind of their plug around it. Mm. Uh, with the slogan water, there's nothing in it, yeah, essentially. Mm. Homeopathy, there's nothing in it because it's just homeopathy, water. Homeopathy, there's nothing yeah. in it, yeah. yeah. Homeopathy, there's, no, there's nothing, nothing, yeah. Well, now let's talk a little bit about <coughs> scope, because this is something that, that continually is discussed within the skeptical community. What is within the scope of skeptical activism and what is not? Um, so is, maybe we'll start, uh, we'll start over there with Brian, or actually Kylie, change my mind. Oh, me, oh. Mm -hmm. Psych. Um, so uh, <laughs> is there anything that you consider outside the scope of skeptical activism, according to your definition of skeptical activism? Well, uh, one of the big things that come to mind um, are particular atheism claims, because um, there's been a few times that I've, uh, for example, the 1023 campaign, I was standing with someone who considered himself culturally Jewish, and I know that he wouldn't have stood next to me if it was a, a particular atheist um, outreach project. Mm. Um, yeah, in, in many ways, I guess it depends on the particular um, context that you're looking at, and whether or not it is uh, something that is going to be inclusive. Uh, one big example that comes to mind is Dr. Martin Bridgestock in Queensland when they were attempting to prevent creationism from getting into Queensland schools. And they found support from uh, some of the more established religious groups out there because they too weren't about getting intelligent designs into schools. They saw it as against their church teachings and saw it against their religion. So it, it depends from case to case, but certainly um, making sure that my atheism and my scepticism are separate is one thing that keeps in mind because yeah, eventually you, you, go, you are going to be choosing your battles and sometimes you have to think to yourself, well, is it going to be more effective if I make a stand on this particular focused issue and finding allies who are going to support you and, and make effective change on the basis of that. Well, who wants to follow up on that then? <laughs> I'll go. Go. Uh, yeah, I would say. I would say first of all, in, <coughs> inbounds and out of bounds. I would say uh, focus. Focus on things that are measurable, testable, and uh, on which you can affect a specific change. Uh, don't waste your time on on anything unwinnable. And that's that's the main reason I would say because I know there's a tremendous overlap between the atheist movement and the skeptical movement. Um, and and I do think if you want to be effective now, uh, separate the two categories for when it comes to your skeptical mm -hmm. activism. Uh, mainly, partly from a PR perspective, because there's people who don't want to hear that there's no ghost, because that means that you're some kind of devil worshiper. Uh, and uh, second of all, when you do your when you do your activism, whatever it is, frame your position in a positive. That, to me, is the number one problem with the skeptic movement: is that is that we are a rejection of of you know of of BS basically, and that's a very hard thing to put on on a button, um, or at least that le it's a very hard thing to get people excited about. But if you can frame it as a specific and positive thing, uh, I, th I think you'll do much better. So it's mm. about marketing as well. Better oh, slogans. absolutely. You've got to start thinking of the bigger picture. And, and it's not, it feels so good to stuff it in the face of somebody who believes something nutty, uh, but you're accomplishing nothing most of the time. Mm. What you're doing is you're building an enemy, you're building somebody who's more steeled in their erroneous beliefs. Uh, and it means you've got to be more patient and allow people, the most important step is to allow them 
to take that final leap. You gotta lay everything out in front of them and let them be the one to piece it all together. Like, hey, wait a minute. I learned how these placebo bands work just as well as the original. Maybe that means, and then they get to that last piece themselves, then you make a, a meaningful impact on someone. Mm. Um, I, I, I don't actually think that there's very much that's outside of the scope of activism necessarily, as long as you understand uh, what you are uh, trying to accomplish. So if you have, like I said, a clear objective um, that you're trying to do, and, and also when you're building a campaign, as long as you, it's really a good idea to do two things. One is um, keep it to a single issue, um, because if you're trying to solve all of the problems, you're gonna, you're gonna have a harder time of it. Um, and, and the second piece, which will help uh, having a single issue campaign, uh, is build your allies. And, and, and you know, Kylie's point was a good one, which is you know, in, in certain cases, you may ally with people that you don't necessarily agree with on every issue, but you can agree with on this one issue um, and if you can work with them then uh, you've built a relationship and yeah maybe the next day you're going to be on the opposite side of the you know uh, of the fence on b b with them but at least you have worked together in the past and can have a little bit more of a reasonable dialogue potentially um, but I don't actually think even even I mean I don't see any reason that atheist issues or skeptical issues should be outside of the scope of um, of, of activism I think there are um, I think you but again I do think Think you need to pick your battles and stick to things that you can win um, and mm -hmm. and can and can prove that you've won. Debbie. Well, actually, this is one of those questions I think where I'd have a different answer depending on whether we're talking about what the big organization should do versus what an individual mm -hmm. should do or what the local groups can get involved with. When it comes to the big orgs, I do think that there are lots and lots of things that we should not address. An obvious field is kind of economics and some political questions. Um, we often find at CFI that we sort of have um, a split between, it seems to be Democrats and Libertarians mostly. <laughs> <laughs> there aren't many people in the middle yeah, of there. Yeah, we, we don't have them, the yeah. latter one. So yeah, tell us about um, them. Yeah. So there are things that we have to be really hands off about where most people might feel one way and then there's some people with very good arguments another way where skepticism, critical thinking, naturalism, even atheism doesn't bring everyone to the same conclusion and that's a really big point to make. So the big orgs, uh, I agree with DJ that there are issues that we leave to other groups and it might come down to things like, oh, every th I have a bias here so it's hard for me to say that we should be hands off with some of these things but some big issues that are tangled uh, with social messes, messes where um, skepticism doesn't necessarily bring us all to the same conclusion. When it comes to individual activism, however, I think we can use the tools of skepticism and critical thinking in our personal interactions, in our daily lives, in our jobs, with our families to do small activism to help change minds, whether it be on things like ooh, same-sex marriage or uh, reproductive rights or voting, uh, certain kinds of ways. Um, I, I think with my father, I'd help convince him with data and critical thinking to change his mind about how he voted. You know, it was a tools of skepticism mm -hmm. for something I would never bring to CFI or the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry for the conclusions I sort of wanted him to get to. Mm. Well, is it possible that we can do, uh, sort of as Maria was talking about with, with using pressure, can we pressure uh, political parties to try to change and, and reform certain policies and certain laws without actually being involved in politics? Uh, I, I don't think there's a, a universal or automatic reticence to being involved in political activism, but as long as that activism is focused on the science and skepticism issues that the organization's missions limit their focus on. So for instance, uh, uh, I know my 10 years at CFI, we did uh, uh, often campaigns around certain political issues, but they were focused on the mission of that organization. Or um, the, the JREF might, uh, uh, the, the examples that were mentioned earlier, the two campaigns that we've actually talked about, the uh, the, what I would consider the raising awareness campaign of the, of the placebo bans and what I would consider the activism campaign of the 1023 work, um, the activism campaign of the 1023 work sought to do a few things. One, uh, to, change, to, to change the um, positions of 
U.S. pharmaceutical companies. We, the JREF was the national uh, sponsor of the 1023 campaign in the U.S. And we did an actual letter writing campaign to executives of Walgreens and Rite Aid not to just raise their awareness uh, that some people disagreed about homeopathy, but to get them to have a different policy about how they labeled and displayed those sorts of things. The same can be true politically. Uh, uh, we we haven't announced this. This is private uh, because there's really no so news yet to report. Don't tell anybody. Um, uh, it's not private, and uh, I guess in that way, um, because uh, just don't tell anyone outside this room, right? Um, in in uh, in this area right now, uh, there is a. Um, there's an organization, kind of a, uh, f what I would consider a likely fraudulently um, uh, health provider, kind of making very strong claims about curing cancer using a gizmo. And that's as nondescript as I'll be. So what we've done behind the scenes is uh, work with governmental oversight agencies, kind of making official complaints, both with the FDA and FTC. That's a kind of activism. That's a role for the JREF. And when we get to the point where maybe there can be more uh, uh, grassroots involvement, then there's a letter writing campaign or something else. Politics isn't off limits in general, but it would be outside the purview of, I think, both the JREF and even, so this is the answer to your scope question, the skeptics movement to say, um, let's co-opt this group of people all uni unified by the, what I mentioned at the very beginning, science advocacy, consumer protection, and, and uh, uh, kind of dealing with claims nobody else is dealing with. Let's instead talk everybody else into advocating for gay marriage, say. Um, I'm a gay guy, I'm real pro-gay marriage, but I think it would be a fuzzy, a kind of a muddying of the waters for me to go to my skeptic group and say, we're all progressive and liberal and, and let's stop doing this other thing that we care about over here, or in addition to doing that, let's all become gay rights activists. That doesn't mean I'm against gay rights. I spend hours of my week working on gay rights, but that's, I think that's a good way to distinguish uh, between these uh, scope questions. Mm. Okay, um, so maybe sorry. we, oh. I, I just want to add, oh, please, uh, just to clarify. So it would sort of be a situation like maybe you, you, that you wouldn't have the skeptical movement involved in, let's say, um, the pro choice movement. Exactly. But on the other hand, it would be very easy to have a campaign around uh, abstinence only education because there is science to back up that issue. Yeah, so spot on truth. So the skeptics movement has been involved in the gay rights movement, not only individually when we all advocate for gay rights, but as skeptics when. Uh, our cultural competitors make really nonsensical pseudoscientific arguments against uh, uh, gay parents, for instance. They use quack social science to say, if you're gay parents, your kids are going to be uh, messed up, and here's the quack social science to back it up. Well, the skeptic can say something about that that often the gay rights activists don't say. They say, oh, you're bigot, religious, political extremists, and the skeptic can say, let's examine those pseudoscientific claims and look at the real science. Kylie? Yeah. Oh, um, it's also useful when, as you said, a larger group can support smaller groups out there and say, okay, we have this power to have a voice where we can send out newsletters to thousands of right. people globally. Um, we'd like to raise awareness of the Nightingale Collaboration, which right. is a smaller group that is just still trying to find its feet. I remember the Vaccine Times was another example of, of a small group who tries to seek to get a bigger audience, and that's one of the great powers of uniting in a larger group that you right, can help right. out the smaller ones out there. The only risk is that the larger group mm -hmm. it, uh, is not going to be monolithic on every issue. No, and no. we've found as organizers, when you're trying to get a bunch of, you know, the only thing skeptics agree on is, you know, that I'm right and, and you're right only if you agree with me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, yeah. we all suffer what, from what I've called the Mensa effect, where one person says, I'm very, very smart, and therefore I'm right. Yeah. And you're very smart, so you should know that I'm right. <laughs> you know, and, and that's yeah. hard to organize around if you say to a big group of people, here's our party line. Here yeah. are all the social issues everyone must agree upon, because we don't all agree. You know, and, there, and you can't use the kind of skepticism I'm talking about that looks at testable claims about the paranormal and pseudoscience to arrive at a consensus decision about whether Keynesian economics or Hayek is right about 
central planning. I mean, it's just, they're different ball games. If someone can actually organize an activist campaign around that, I will give you $5. Yeah, I love it, I love that. So what are the, some, of the, uh, some of the challenges, I guess, for people that are thinking of getting involved in skeptical activism? Maybe they're talking about um, pressuring political parties, or they're talking about letter writing campaigns, or the, the vaccine clinic. Um, what are some of the challenges that, that people can sort of expect? Anyone? I, I, so um, as I've been working with the Atlanta Skeptics for a few years now, and, uh, I, and I think a lot of local groups run into a similar issue, which is, you know, they, we, we start out, we started out with like four people, we've grown very quickly, we do Skeptics in the pub, we wanted to do more. I think one of our biggest challenges is what do we do and how do we do it? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and so actually Desiree and I uh, have put together a workshop um, to help uh, local groups who want to start doing activism um, do it effectively. Uh, and so I think the biggest challenge, well, I think for, as speaking from, a, from somebody who had no idea what activism was about or how to do it, my biggest challenges were um, what, do I, what do I tackle? Um, what are the legal issues with me uh, taking on a, a campaign? Uh, like this, am I am I putting myself at any risk? And uh, I have no money. How do I, you know, organize a campaign? So I think those were kind of the big things um, around it, which is a lot. <laughs> I actually have um, something kind of fuzzy to introduce here that also touches on DJ's last uh, comment, which is that I think a lot of particularly young skeptics or skeptics who come into uh, local groups from the blogs, the blogosphere, the websites, mm -hmm. do really um, think that skepticism and atheism are these hugely overlapping spheres. I think m more and more young bloggers are conflating those, and some of the particularly older people in this movement are very clear that you know classic skepticism does not deal with religion. Um, and I think because of that, except when it makes testable claims. Except when, oh, make, right. yeah, like That's does the statue of Mary weep right. tears of blood? then it's like, yes, we, we can test that. Um, so I think young people sometimes get involved and they're angry and they're angry about God and they're angry about religion and they're, they want, and they think that skeptical activism is also atheist activism and they might encounter these older established groups as I did uh, in Philadelphia that are not interested in dealing with religion at all and feel, rather have a negative response to atheism. And that might turn off a lot of young people, not only because they are um, the established group's anti-atheist, but also because they don't tend to have young people involved, mm. let's say. Uh, I, just to rejoin to that, I think that's a really insightful comment and a, a fault line in this kind of, uh, you'd almost say a coalition between the atheist activists and the skeptic activists, and there's a lot of overlap, yes. Um, at, at the... Uh, I, I wouldn't dis, I, I wouldn't want to overstate it and say all the youngins are ang angry atheists and no. all the old no. folks are kind of soft peddling on the religion issue, but uh, you know very focused on skepticism because you know we had uh, uh, quite a, a large number of young people at TAM this last year, mm -hmm. and most of them were there because of the skepticism right. stuff, not because of atheism stuff. Uh, th that that said. I am unapologetic about telling some young atheist, kind of piss and vinegar atheist, uh, all wound up and angry about what God did to them or their church or something. You know, I'm, an, I'm a former member of what sociologists of religion consider a cult. I've been there, done that. Um, well, I'm unapologetic about telling some angry atheist there are organizations that are perfect for you, yeah. once called American Atheists. They're set up for people who want to fight the excesses of religion in society, and they want to do activism around that. The JREF, as an example, is not that organization. The JREF has, uh, is chartered to have a different mission. Doesn't mean we're not atheists, because in, in, in one sense, we're an atheist organization, since I think all but one employee is an atheist. But we're not an atheist organization functionally or in terms of mission. Right. I also think uh, that one of the problems is that the opposite is sort of true, um, is that because of the idea that skeptical activism equals atheist activism, a lot of people uh, will hesitate to get involved in mm -hmm. skeptical activism yeah. because right. they're worried um, that it's that they're, that they're basically going to be doing atheist activism, and that's 
too much of a uh, they, they just don't feel like they want to jump into that. Um, and so it's really important to kind of define, again, uh, what I find effective is, you know, define your campaign, be very specific about what your issue you're tackling, um, so that it's very clear, here's what you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. I, I worry sometimes about reinventing the wheel. About what? Reinventing the wheel, that you might have a particular campaign, an idea and so forth, and you might not know about the history about what right. worked, what hasn't worked, or got in touch with someone. Um, I'm so happy that um, more and more people who are involved in formal activism are starting to be, you know, being known of amongst um, skeptics out there. And thankfully we have, you know, not only conferences, but we have the internet and networking right. and so forth that has encouraged that. Because it's, yeah, really depressing at times to have someone say, oh, let's, let's do this, da, 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 and I say, yeah, but they tried it here. Or, yeah, yeah we've see, already I, got the framework already here. I, um, I would not worry about that at all. No? Like, well, you just no, go no. for it? No, well, I mean, because, because everything is changing. Uh, the yeah. world as it exists today is not the world of 10 years ago, and the idea that was not right in 1999 might be exactly right in 2011. And of course, but if you have this cost of fear, like, oh, I don't want to look like a dope who's already tried this. Not, not like, so much as looking a dope, but getting to know what has worked out there and using the yeah, powers sure, that have so worked. If you fail, so what? Then get out there and fail. Look, <laughs> success is built upon <laughs> failure. There is no success without an outrageous amount of failure. The, the, you know, the old saying, the way to double your success rate is to double your failure rate. So. Yeah, but I'm not on to, into pushing all my chips onto nah, the red. But, uh, yeah. Get out there and go nuts. What does it doesn't matter? <laughs> I'm I, I was I was really really hoping uh, Brian would say something I would disagree with, and I was pessimistic it would happen. So thank you, Brian. I do disagree, and here's why: um, because I'm scared of my cultural competitors, and my cultural competitors in our society. Thirty years ago, they looked around. Um, and said, the world's going to pot because all these progressive liberal science types have taken over. And they didn't kind of freewheel it and say, well, let's go out and try something and see if it works, do something else. No, instead they kind of got together in smoke-filled back rooms and planned a 30-year strategy. They founded national nonprofits like Heritage Foundation, others, and they had like a 30-year plan to change culture and they did it. Now they have something we don't have, which is they can kind of issue marching orders and everybody salutes the flag and they go and do what they're told and that's not really in the cards for us, uh, but we could work in that direction. Um, and so I probably associate myself with some of the things Kylie said, which is the new activists coming up, let's be a little humble and look at what our forebears have done. Let's see what worked and what didn't. And rather than just saying, all these old white men from the 70s didn't know what they were doing, but I have all the answers. I think that's, I, I think that's some of what we're uh, experiencing right now. You know, people just reinventing the wheel. I, I, I well, and and I, I, I think the only place where you and I disagree is I, I think what you're describing is exactly right if we were a... Um, uh, you know, a, a set institution, and it was important that everybody represent the, the company line or, exactly. or you know, put exactly. on a good face. But I don't believe that. I think what we see now with the skeptical movements is true grassroots uh, upswelling, which means you have this insane marketplace of ideas, and, uh, and naturally what will happen is something out of, completely out of left field where nobody asked permission for anyone, but instead just went and did something, and it will take root and spread like wildfire. And anything that keeps that bubbling up of 8 billion different ideas all yeah. over the planet, I want to see that going. And if I, I just see so many people who are stymied by fear, uh, whether it be of, of you know, wasting their time doing something that somebody's already done before or um, worrying about what somebody else will think of them, that uh, I, I don't want to do or say anything that encourages people to, to be afraid to go out and speak their mind and try to, to spread the word. All well, I can say is I'm damn glad that Simon Singh had a safety net of people mm. who are willing to stand behind him yeah, yeah. because the Guardian newspaper backed off on him and he's an example of someone who did stand up. So I guess one of the caveats I would say in that regard is damn well make sure you have a safe well, yeah, yeah, be smart jump. be smart certainly yeah. make sure you're make sure you're paying attention to what you're saying make sure that it's something you can back up don't I'm not saying go out and be stupid yeah. uh, but uh, but but certainly I'm saying don't let your fear that it's already been done before and I mean you know the, the original question was reinventing the wheels is something you should be worried about and I, I say no so what you made look mm -hmm. even if you reinvented the wheel at the end of the day you built a freaking wheel Mm. Yeah. I'm worried about resources, I guess, in that regard. Yeah. Debbie? Too many resources when there might be something else that can help out. Yeah. Debbie. Oh, me. I did have something to say, but I think we went a little past it. But it does kind of have to do with this distinction between 
older skepticism and the newer skepticism. And I referenced kind of the skeptics that come out of reading the blogosphere and even the blogosphere skeptics. What are the skeptics blogging about? And I think um, I jotted myself a note here, which is that a lot of skepticism, a lot of the skeptic movement um, is defined by who our enemies are, who our cultural competitors are, as DJ said. And maybe in the 70s when the skeptics movement was really birthed um, as organizations existing or not, uh, maybe that was more uh, New Agers and UFO ufologists, ufologists yeah. <laughs> like they're they're an actual field of study. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> and uh, you know, I don't know, homeopaths and stuff. But more recently, because of these foundations and things that have existed, uh, that also came out of the 70s and 80s. Um, it seems that a lot of our cultural competitors now are the religious right and still New Agers and homeopaths and whatnot. But a lot of the battles that skeptics fight have to do with science education in our schools and you know some of these other things that we mentioned that we might be interested in as individual skeptics like same-sex marriage. And who's on the other side of that? It's the religious right, it's <coughs> cultural conservatives. And that, I think, may be why um, we see this entanglement a lot with uh, atheism and skepticism and all these other broader issues because our enemies are mm. the same. I hate to kind of use that language of enemies, but yeah, our cultural competitors. Uh, we wanted to leave some time for questions because if you do have questions about skeptical activism, you have a panel full of experts. So does anyone have questions? No. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, Brian, you said earlier if you want to uh, do some skeptical activism to frame it in a positive way, can you give an example of that? And also, uh, somewhere over here, maybe DJ said you want to uh, try to have measurables. Um, do you have some examples of those? Uh, well, well, certainly some of the best work in skepticism has been done on the homeopathy side of things, where it's like it's a positive claim to say, uh, you know, instead of saying, this is crap, this is crap, this is crap. I would say, you know, um, uh, this, you know, if you have cancer, this has been proven effective. Or, you know, it's, I, well, also when I say positive, I mean it needs to be something crystal clear that, that, that you, by making your point, uh, affect a positive change. And it has to be something, uh, people are drawn toward things, not away from things. People look at people shouting no, 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 and view it as an obstacle to get to where they want to be. I'm saying don't be the guy that just st stands there saying no, no, no. Figure out a way to make your point in a positive way. And again, the placebo bands is the perfect example of that. And, 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 for and, 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 like, and likewise, on Scam School, we never once said uh, the power balance bands are, are total bogus. Mm -hmm. What we say is, hey, see these sports guys? They're wearing these power balance bands. I don't know if they work, but I know for sure these don't work. Now watch me scam these people into thinking they work by pe teaching them the tools. At no point did I directly challenge them, but by the time the episode was over, somebody could take one of these bands or a rubber band or anything else, run out and trick their buddies into paying them $50 for it because they're convinced it has magical powers. And in that case, I, I would argue you almost have uh, more of an effect because by making somebody taste the drug of, of, of dece deceiving someone else, it gives them an immunity to being deceived themselves. Uh, the other, uh, another good example of that is, uh, so I do a lot of work with, um, uh, against anti-vaccination. And so instead of our message being vaccines are perfectly safe and don't cause autism, mm -hmm. our, our message is be a hero, get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, this is what will happen if you get vaccinated, you will save lives. Um, so we really focus on that. When it comes to measurable outcomes, um, I can't say enough about how important this is. Um, when you build a campaign, figure out what your goals are and then break those out into how will you measure success. So for example, if your goal in, again, going back to the vaccine campaign, my goal for this, this year's vaccine campaign is to run out of vaccinations, mm -hmm. right? So we have however many Tdaps and however many flu shots out there. All of you, please tomorrow, between 10 and, f 10 and 4, go over to the Marriott 109 mm -hmm. and get vaccinated. Um, uh, and so that's our primary objective, is to get people vaccinated. Our secondary objective is to raise awareness about how important the Tdap in particular is. Um, and that 
is harder to measure, right? But what we're doing is we're actually asking somebody to get a vaccination. They're actually having to do something. So we can measure at least that. Um, and uh, but, you can, you, but there's lots of ways you can measure things. You can measure media hits. Mm -hmm. how, how many, you know, how much media coverage did you get? You or can, how many letters sent? In how many letters were sent? Um, what was the response here? You know, what's the resp what, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? And did you accomplish it really at a very basic level? And when you sit down and think about those things, it really can either break apart your campaign, like something that sounded like a really good idea doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but it can then allow you to build up, here's what really we really want to do. Mm. And, and let, uh, one other thing, uh, keep in mind, uh, I think it is a posi positive thing to arrest criminals uh, or, or frauds, I mean, you know, legal frauds. That's a, that's a positive message as well. We're not saying there are no ghosts, we're not saying that, um, that you can't heal with your hands, we're saying that we know for a fact this person is a criminal and is ripping off old ladies. You right, know, that's right. again, keep it specific, keep it measurable, mm -hmm. and keep it so that the public will universally be on your side. Uh, there's been uh, just a little conflation in our conversation and because it comes so naturally because we're talking about outreach and, ed ed and educational initiatives and activism at the same time. But the one way to draw the distinction is activism first and foremost wants to change something right now. Mm -hmm and not just mind share or like get new members or something, but you wanna change this thing in society. So if you have an activism campaign around gay marriage, you want the state you're working in to allow gay marriage. If you have an activism campaign around a, a TV faith healer, you want uh, charges to be filed against him or you want him to uh, suffer so much financially he files bankruptcy or you want, uh, you want him to be exposed. So it, do it doesn't always have to be political, but activism is always about change. And raising awareness or outreach isn't. Sometimes that's just about, uh, it, you know, what Brian's talking about, the power bands. It is, that is fantastic. I consider that outreach or even educational and much more effectively educational than telling people they're idiots. That's his mm -hmm. one take-home take message. That's the important thing that he's saying in, in that part of it, which is... Uh, you're, you're going to, what, you, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. You're, you're going to um, get further if you don't piss people off by making them feel stupid. Are you trying to say don't be a dick? Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, may, maybe I shouldn't say this dickish thing, but I think even uh, saying the word dick is a little dickish. But anyway, yeah. Don't be yeah. a clitoris. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Don't be a dick until it's time to be a dick yeah, and you're doing right it with, it with forethought. Yeah. Because look, look, just look at the history of the skeptical movement. Randy is, Randy has been many times by, by, uh, in many circumstances what this conversation would probably describe as a dick. He challenges someone who he thinks is likely fraudulent, goes on Carson and humiliates uh, uh, Pop -off. Peter Popoff. Yeah. Uh, exposes him, right? He wasn't nice and milk toast and friendly and, well, he might be doing it this way or that way. He exposed and that was very challenging. Or he uh, sets up a gotcha moment for Uri Geller on Carson, where Uri Geller, there's like long dead air of Uri Geller looking like a dumb ass, right? That was um, so good. He was, he was a dick. Yeah. He, he, well, he doesn't always act like, I mean, he's challenging, you know? Well, can I paraphrase this? Hopefully, hopefully everyone will agree with this. Um, if you have an objective, first, of, first and foremost, before you do anything else, if you have an objective, if you decide that being a dick is going to achieve your objective the best, if that's going to be the most effective way, then by all means use it. Well but if that is not going to, if that is not going to have the best chance of achieving your objective, why would you? Yeah, and, and Phil's insight is that often that's not the best method right. to achieve right. exactly. a goal. It yeah. sometimes can be, but often it's not. Next question. I figured it would be a good idea if it's a panel about um, activism to kind of give a, a real world current situation for y'all to talk about and critique and give your opinions on when you're not you thought it succeeded, and I can't think of a better example than what American atheists are doing right now in regards to the 9-11 uh, cross. I know it's more on the atheist side than uh, the skepticism side, but like I said, it's current. Uh, it's, in the, in the, it's in the conversation. It made daily shows. So what do y'all think? Do you think they're succeeding or they're failing or what? Anyone? So uh, 
this is, from my vantage, this is where you just have to pick your battles. And I love American atheists. I'm a member. I'm a member of Amer Americans United for Separation Church and State and CFI. I'm a supporter of all these organizations because they each have their niche and they each do their important thing. But I'm not one of the atheist activists whose idea of a good time is to get together in a little group and sit in an assembly line and X out in God we trust on all our dollar bills, right? That's a kind of activism. You have a goal in mind. You want God off your money, and you're going to work to that end. I think there are more important battles, and I, you know, I'm going to piss off all my atheist buddies, but I think there are bigger atheist battles to fight than civil religion or ceremonial deism as the high court calls it, you know, God on your money or a cross somewhere. That's, those are important church state separation issues and there are national organizations that focus on that. But for my money, there's a better way to spend my activism hours, uh, if, if you want my point. Anyone I, else? I can't answer because I'm not an American atheist. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I, I'm not tuned in on this at all. But, but I will say that if you want to polarize everyone and get everyone to completely solidify their position either way, just make sure to associate whatever your point is with 9-11. Then you'll get absolutely nothing done. <laughs> Thank you. That's Next question. Yeah, just on that point, he got bad press on The Daily Show, by the way. Horrible. American Atheist was kind of made fun of. Uh, that point should be made. Hi. Uh, first, just want to thank you all. I think this is a really, really important topic and a really, a really important panel. Um, second of all, to make an analogy, uh, I sort of feel like we are one percent. Uh, the purveyors of Huck are another one percent, mm -hmm. and the majority of everyone else are undecided voters. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're just consumers that are trying to figure out whether to vaccinate their kids or whether to get acupressure or whatnot. Do you? Given limited resources and the, the varying degrees of, uh, of activism, local, medium, and national levels, is it easier to go after, or more effective, go after the hearts and minds of the undecided voters, or to attack our, I, I forget the euphemism, cultural, cultural competitors? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't actually think there's a lot of point in going after our what did we call them? Cultural our enemies, <laughs> right? Enemies. The, people, the people who are peddling the crap. We're not going to change their minds. Um, we well, can go. Expose them. We can yeah. expose them. And, and but again, the the goal there is to protect the the other 98 percent. So everything we're doing should be focused on that 98 percent, whether it's outreach, whether it's education, whether it's pressure tactics. It should be focused around being effective at protecting or educating or helping that 98 percent, in my right. opinion. When Randy exposed this faith healer on TV for having a hearing aid in his ear and hearing his wife's voice instead of God's, he wasn't only, nor even primarily doing it, to stick it to that faith healer because right. he hated him. He was doing it because he felt a kind of humanistic regard and empathy for the parishioners or the churchgoers who were being duped by that huckster. His motivation were the deceived, his target was the deceiver. And I think that's an important way to draw, draw the distinction. Anyone else over there? Yeah, CFI and the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry right now are engaged in a campaign against, I don't know how, I've only read these words and not had to <laughs> say them out loud, but Boiron, Boiron is Bo French. Boiron. 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 B-O-I-R-O-N. For Oslococcinum. Yeah. <laughs> What just happened? <laughs> 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 oh, oh, no, 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 speaking in tongues <laughs> right now. Oslo Kosinum. Someone call Dr. Karen Stolzner. No, we got yeah. a live one. Uh, yes. On three different issues, because they're trying to get the FDA to require them to put their labels in English and not in Latin to say we have what duck's liver diluted um, to none in yeah. <laughs> these remedies for you. Um, oh, duck's liver and something else bizarre, uh, and two other things. Uh, but it's kind of assistance with consumer advocacy campaigns. Right, right. It's do not market this to people as real medicine. That's a direct action that's that's activism that the organizations are involved in. I'm not sure if it's going to lead down to some grassroots action that people can take. But it's not, in some way it is attacking the company directly. It's trying to sort of hurt their sales and educate people to stop buying their, their useless products. Right, but you're still speaking to a different audience. We're speaking the to company. the audience, and we're speaking to people who can make laws about their products, exactly. too. Yeah. 
It's the consumer protection mission of the skeptics movement that I'm afraid will be lost if we only focus on our pet social issues. So everyone seems to be talking consumer protection. That pleases me. Okay. You know, I almost wonder if, uh, in, the, in the case of homeopathy, if the skeptics movement couldn't take a page from the folks who are hardcore against genetically modified foods. They want it specifically labeled, specifically right. you know, outed as being genetically modified, and that's being handled without the aid of, of, of laws, just purely at the, you know, shame on you, Walmart, you need to label your food. Uh, I think it would be fine to, uh, to have a campaign to out, you know, if, if they don't respond to, to a, a nice please, uh, to, to out a particular uh, pharmacy chain for saying, look, man, you got the real stuff next to junk, and that's not cool. You know, yeah. I think that's a fantastic idea, and I hope someone wrote that down. Yeah. yeah. And but, uh, it. You, just speaking on that, the next 1023 campaign, uh, I think we've discussed this a bit. You helped out organizing mm -hmm. the 1023 campaign with JREF this last year in the United States. Wouldn't it be great if activists at, at the local level, you guys get riled up, you want to be part of the 1023 campaign in the States, so you get uh, from the JREF or one of the other national organizations a roll of stickers that you, you go on and you, you stick on the counter uh, at the local pharmacy that says not real medicine. Now you don't want to do property damage, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're easy illegal. peel off stickers or something, but it's a way to raise awareness in a way that applies pressure on a national right. pharmacy chain. So it's not enough just to get together and decry what you don't believe in, but it's going out there and boots on the ground. There was, a, uh, there was a grassroots Absolutely. movement a few years ago of people going around with um, citation needed stickers that looked exactly that. like the link that. from Wikipedia uh, sticking yeah. out everywhere. Yeah. 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 And, and I wanted to mention one other quick thing, and I'm really sorry because I know there's a big line here, but um, it's interesting what you brought up because one response I saw to the CFI's email about uh, trying to get the FDA to get the boy Ron it's spelled to uh, label their things in English and th make these other changes is that we were statist, that we were trying to use right. the state to legislate these things when it should have been consumer awareness, consumer advocacy, consumer education issues, that we shouldn't use the FDA, that people should be able to buy whatever they want and companies can label whatever they want, but we use the mm -hmm. Kind of the power of consumer education well, to, to make I, I think this is also the the whole idea of casting a wide tent you yeah. know it's like you want to, this is just like you want to work with church groups when it comes to bringing down certain pseudosciences i think you want to work with the libertarians by saying uh you know okay maybe you don't want to involve the the hammer of law in order to affect this change uh because i you know being one of those nut jobs uh mm -hmm. i i am i am highly uncomfortable with the government deciding what is and is not science so i would prefer to see, uh, you know, public shaming of people who uh, refuse to differentiate between, you Medical know, between real design. medicine versus mm -hmm. not real medicine. Well, maybe in this situation, Australia is different. Bayani Mills' interview on the Token Skeptic talks about what method should you go through in Australia to which correct government department you can report to. So, Socialists. Yeah. yeah well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now I'm definitely leaving this side of the panel. We have but time yeah, for certainly one. Certainly find out if you, whether or not you support the government or not. There are pathways, and, and do try them first, I guess, yeah. if you can. One yeah. last question. Okay. Um, two quick things. One quick thing. Um, I'm going to support the vaccination thing going on down there. I want some other people to be to have a sore arm besides me. <laughs> but, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, goes into what you're talking about with the reinventing the wheel thing. Mm. Um, I kind of agree with both sides of the issue that. Now, sometimes reduplicating something that we already know works and that maybe just looking over and seeing what this group did well, and worked, you know, be, save time, mm -hmm. and, uh, next one. Yeah, or look over and see how this group fell flat on its face will keep you from wasting your time, but sometimes you're not so much reinventing the wheel, but you can do things now that you couldn't do before. Yeah, right. as, as right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brian's yeah. point. Yeah. Okay, so it's like, like the Wright the brothers so weren't fun. reinventing the wheel. They were finally succeeding where so many people tried before. Mm. So. Can I actually just sort of interject on this one? Um, no. I agree. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, Social I, I agree with that because although we, I do want people to look at the history of the skeptical movement and what we've already done, um, situations do change and there could be different people involved in those groups. The political climate could be different. Um, different people could be involved. There's, there's a lot different of room countries. to maneuver there. Different countries. Yeah. Um, so that's not to say if something failed in another place, um, it's going to fail here. Mm -hmm. But really do take a good look at the history and figure out how that campaign went so you can figure out how not to make the same mistakes. Perfect. Or that something might 
sorry, or something that puts the seed here will flow on space here. Be, be inspired. Yeah. 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 Be inspired. And I'm sorry, we don't really have. Yeah, we do. We oh, have one. Okay, one more. Go. Go. Okay. My, my question follows no, up directly on that. So no. my, my question is, we talked about uh, not avoiding failures. What are those failures? What are our most or least successful uh, campaigns? What are the mistakes we need to avoid in the future? They're the ones you've never heard about. Yeah. <laughs> We've still yes, got freaking anti-vaccination yeah. groups in bloody Australia for a start. So yeah, we just got to keep on plugging on in some cases and, and hopefully with more awareness, more time and so forth. I've, I've known lots of really enthusiastic people who have, have started things, particularly in anti-vaccination. Mm. It's just we didn't convince that politician. You know, the letter writing campaign, they ignored it. Da, 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 da. Okay, well... Let's just keep on keeping on it, and maybe we'll find more methods and certainly research and find out what works. I, I guess that's part of the reason I, I don't worry about reinventing the wheels because for the most part, if, when your goal is education to affect perception, uh, for the most part, the biggest failure you're going to have is that everyone ignores you, in which case, so what? Yeah. You, you, you're wasting uh, some work. I worry about Mavericks. I don't want to have more Simon Singhs out there who end up saying a word like bogus and then find themselves being arrested. Mm. Simon and, Singhs a good lesson. And, and the real sad answer to your question is that in the history of the skeptics movement, there has been too little activism to have too many failures. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. We've yeah. only yeah, really started getting our activism mm -hmm. legs. I know in yeah. Denver and they were trying to uh, fund the state or city, I don't know, was trying to fund an astrobiology commission. I don't know what the result of the skeptical activism against that was, because the goal was to have the tax dollars not fund this commission for basically researching aliens. But I don't know if, I feel like they, the skeptics failed because I didn't hear that they succeeded, but I'm not sure whether or not they succeeded. Down. It was voted down? Yes. yes. Win, 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 win. Win. And on that successful note, we are completely out of time. Um, one more thing before you applaud. You can applaud in one second. There's one more activism panel. Maria is moderating that, and that's on Monday at 2.30, and that's specifically about what you can do all by yourself or with a group um, to affect change in skeptical activism. Called, uh, how to be a real-life superhero. Okay, so now you can applaud. Thank you to the guests. <laughs>